Okay, uh, let's uh, make a spot. My apologies for being a few minutes late. I've just been on a conference call where the state of California is discussing how it should move forward in building an earthquake early warning system. Sorry, you're going to indulge me for one minute. Uh, so the state is currently deciding how it should implement a statewide earthquake early warning system. And there are various groups involved in this discussion. The universities that run the seismic networks like Berkeley, Caltech, um, the US Geologic Survey, the California Office of Emergency Services, and then of course a slew of private sector companies, companies like Everbridge, I don't know if you know Everbridge, the kind of companies that Blackboard is another one that put out uh, mass notification alerts. And then also uh, a company that is actually trying to um, build an early warning system itself, as in actually install sensors um, on the ground. And this particular private company, thinks that if the, the earthquake, California's earthquake early warning system is openly available to every member of the public, that will undercut their business model, because of course their business model is to charge a subscription to, to get access. So they are advocating that California's state earthquake early warning system should instead um, be a subscription-only service, and should, the alert should not be openly available to individual members of the public. And even more than that, they argue that really there's not much value in providing alerts to individual members um, of the public, because they don't know what to do with it. So I would like a show of hands. How many people in this room think that California's earthquake early warning system should be available to individual members of the public, i.e. you personally? Okay, that was the wrong question. How many think that it should not? Oh, we have one. Excellent. Do you want to comment why? I understand the average doesn't do it across the area. So anybody want to suggest what we might do about that problem? I think that's a valid concern. So what might we do about it? Are you going to? No? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you could educate people as to what to do with it. So the, the, I mean, there's the, what you should do, we haven't talked about the quick early warning, so I told you I was asking you to indulge me for a moment, but I just had a very frustrating hour on the phone. So what, so what we would do is we would educate people as to what to do. And the truth is, what you as an individual would do with an earthquake early warning message that may just be a few seconds or maybe a minute is exactly the same thing you do if you feel shaking, right? You, you move to a safe zone immediately. The difference being, of course, that you would actually be in that safe zone before the shaking started rather than trying to move to it and while the shaking is going on. So do you think that is satisfactory? Okay, so how many people think that earthquake early warning should not be available to every member of the public? Excellent. I am going to report this uh, statistical finding on the next conference call um, that we have. Did you have a comment? Right. So the comment here was that, you know, so we talk about it and you guys now know what you should do in earthquakes and you will know what to do if you've got an earthquake early warning, but, you know, most people don't have access to this class is basically what you're saying, right? And that's exactly right. So, of course, a public education campaign has to take this into account and have to reach out to people in many ways. You mentioned kids in schools. One of the ways that they deal with this in Japan is that they, it's part of the required curriculum at, I'm not sure what level, but, you know, middle school level, maybe high school level. It's part of the required curriculum, not just how to use early warning because they have a warning system, but also how to be ready for earthquakes. And their approach is that, well, you know, again, you have a captive audience, right? So if you educate all of the kids as they go through school, they then go home and they educate their parents. And obviously, over the course of one generation, you then essentially have everybody educated. So that, although it seems like that takes a long time, it takes a generation, that's actually a very effective uh, model for a public education. Yeah. Yeah, Japan's warning system is open to the public. You can, you can download a bunch of apps. In fact, I have one of their apps on my phone, so I get warnings when they're shaking in Tokyo. Um, so yes, you can download their apps, and it's an it's open public early warning system. Mexico City is the other large-scale uh, earthquake early warning system, and it's openly available to everybody, to the public as well. You can download apps to get it. It's outrageous what this company is trying to do. This is being recorded, right? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to use any name. All right, so um, let's talk about what we're supposed to talk about today, um, which is plate tectonics. Um, just briefly to remind you, we talked about this at length. Thursday is the midterm. Um, there are example questions um, posted um, on the class website. Um, the exam will be in here, in this room. Um, we're obviously, we'll do things a little differently. Um, so we will seat you in this room. So on Thursday, do not come in here until we ask you to come in. So if everybody can just accumulate outside, um, and then uh, you'll come in when, when we're ready for you, um, that will obviously speed things up. It will take us a little while to get everybody in and everybody seated and to start the exam. So the exam will only be a one-hour exam. However, we probably won't get started realistically until quarter past 20 past 11. So you need to be, you'll need to be here until about 12.30, let's say. Questions? If you're left-handed, yes, you can request to be on the end. Is that you by any chance? Any other questions? Yeah. No, you don't need to bring a Scantron, you don't need to bring a blue book, anything like that. You need to bring whatever tools you have used um, during the course of the, the class, right? So a calculator, a, I don't know, a rule. I mean, what you, whatever you've used to do the various assignments and the homeworks and the material is what you need. Yeah. Those of you who have DSP accommodations, also, you will meet here. Um, you'll make yourself known, um, and you can sort of gather over here, and then you'll be taken to a, a separate place to, to, to do that. If you have concerns, if you have DSP um, accommodations, and if you have concerns about it, you should talk to GSI before Thursday. Yes. Um, I think you know, yeah, calculators on the phone is a no-no. <laughs> Sorry. If I see people looking at phones, I'll assume you're cheating. Yeah. Um, hmm. You need, okay, I'm going to fall back to my original statement, which is well rehearsed for good reason. You need any kind of tool, you need the same tools that you've used to do all of the assignments and the homeworks and the reports and to do the study. Yeah. Yeah, sample questions are, the, I mean, they really are just random questions taken as an example. Yeah, I realize it's interesting that phone question, you're the first person to ask. I understand, I use my phone as a calculator now as well. But you understand the problem, right? I can't, we can't really have people accessing their phones during the exam. Yeah. So the question was, and I'm going to take a vote on this, we could just make any logarithmic calculations easy enough to do in your head. Is anybody not okay with that? Sorry, I knew what the answer would be. <laughs> okay? Any other questions? <laughs> I won't quote you. <laughs> yeah. This is down a dangerous path. Sorry. Any other questions? William will be your best friend now. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right. So um, the field trip report is due today. I can see many of you are handing them in, as is uh, assignment number two. As with all of the homeworks, um, they are due at 5 p.m. on the due date. So 5 p.m. today, you can hand them in now. The, if you don't hand them in now, they have to be put in the mailboxes, which is in room 340 um, in McComb Hall. Um, and that office is locked at 5 o'clock. That's why it's a 5 o'clock deadline. So um, they, the, you know, the department locks those kinds of uh, rooms at 5 p.m. So that's the reason for the deadline. Okay, any questions? Let's move into today's material, which you all know already, based on how keen you were to use plate tectonics to answer my questions um, in terms of observations on uh, uh, 
the basic on Thursday. Um, so, so we're going to run through what plate tectonics is. You now know what it is based on, on what we talked about on Thursday. Um, but I, I kind of want to give you a, an overview. You all covered this in high school. It's part of the required curriculum. Um, but I just kind of want to recap because, of course, it's so fundamental um, to, to everything that we do in solid earth science. Uh, Bruce Bolt's book covers this in chapter seven. So I encourage you to do the reading, uh, particularly because we'll be going through this material pretty quickly. OK. Oh, and again, the exam will include all material up to and including today's lecture. Okay, so this obviously will be on the exam. OK, so plate tectonics. So the, what's the origins of plate tectonics? We talked about um, how people started to make observations and, and, and that developed into plate tectonics. But we can actually go much further back. The observations we were talking about was seismicity and the symmetry. I'm going to come to that again in a moment. But we can go back much further um, to, to what was called continental drift. So before plate tectonics, instead, there was this proposal of continental drift. Um, and, and the idea of continental drift was that the continents, perhaps at some point, were actually connected to one another. And the original arguments for why um, they should fit together are obviously just based on the coastline. This little sketch here, the, the coastlines of North and South America fit pretty nicely with Africa uh, and Europe across. If you sort of essentially remove the Atlantic, the two continents um, fit together um, uh, very nicely. And so this goes back a long time. It was uh, eight, 1620 was when Francis Bacon first observed that these, um, uh, that these things, these continents, continental margins, seem to line up quite nicely. But it wasn't until much later, until the mid-1800s, um, that it was first proposed that continents did actually fit together. So people kind of made this interesting observation. Wow, that's quite a coincidence. Um, that the, um, uh, the, the coastlines line up. So that's a correlation, right? The coastlines correlate with one another in that sense. But there was no proposed causation um, in that they actually did at some point uh, fit together until the mid-1800s. Um, and then some additional evidence as, as the field of geology came into its own, um, there was additional observations that were made um, that were sort of consistent with this. Alfred Wagner um, pointed out that not only do the continents fit together, but there's also fossil mountain belts um, and, and fossils. Sorry, on this map, this is about the fossils. But there are mountain belts that can be seen to stretch, continue across these boundaries, now currently broken by one of the oceans. And in addition, there are these belts of fossils, right? So these two in particular. And you see them in these belts that actually are found to kind of continue across multiple continents, continents that also seem to fit together. And so he kind of made this observation of these fossil belts, and then he actually proposed that indeed the continents at some point were actually um, slotted together. And he called it continental drift. The idea that these continents were at some point um, attached, as shown here, and then over a period of time they had gradually drifted apart to, to, you know, to the maps, um, the map of the globe that we're familiar with today. And so he put it out there. Of course, it was an insane idea. Right? I mean, how crazy is this? We know that our continents are stationary. The landmass is stationary. It's fixed. It doesn't move. It's always the same. Generation after generation, it's exactly the same. So how crazy would it be if these continents actually somehow at some point were slotted together and it had gradually drifted apart? It was completely counter to our understanding of the solid Earth at the time. And so basically the idea just died. Um, and so the message here is that just making these kinds of observations is not enough. In addition to the observations, so first of all, you want to make observations, and then you need some sort of physical model um, for, for what's happened. And there was no physical model. There was no explanation of how it would be possible for these continents to drift, um, to drift apart. Um, so, so that was the reason the idea died. We just had observations, but no real explanation for how that would have happened. And so continental drift as an idea disappeared off the radar screen in the early 1900s. And it didn't come back until, essentially, until World War II. And there was a sea change in the technology that was available um, during World War II. The first thing was a global bathymetry map. This map is actually not from World War II. This map is uh, the sort of modern global bathymetry map. And these maps are actually developed using satellites. And the way that they develop uh, this detailed uh, bathymetry is that they, they look at the um, orbits of satellites. And of course, the orbits of satellites are controlled by the gravitational field. And so the orbits of the satellite sort of goes up or down. The elevation increases, or sorry, the altitude increases or decreases a little bit as the Earth's gravitational field changes. And so you can measure the Earth's gravitational field with incredible precision based on tracking very accurately the orbits of satellites. And of course, when you have um, variations in the depth of water, that um, can be seen in variations in the Earth's gravitational field. And so you can back estimate what the actual depths of the oceans are from, from these gravitational variations. So that the modern maps that are complete like this are based on satellite observation, of course, in tandem with some actual spot observations. The maps of what the bathymetry uh, looked like uh, previously were based on soundings, places where people went out and they literally reeled out a very, very long cable to see how deep the ocean was. And so there were many spot observations of the depths of the oceans um, prior to this. So anyway, in the Second World War, um, there, there was a real need um, to understand what the ocean's bathymetry looked like. Anybody uh, want to make a guess as to why this was so cr critical? Yeah. So say that again. Well, OK, oh, I see, I see. Yes, so you're saying the reason it's important to know this for, um, for the question of plate tectonics is because where it comes together, what matters is the edge of the continental shelf, so the edge of this pink region rather than the coastline. That is absolutely true, but I'm asking a slightly different question. What was it during the Second World War that motivated uh, high, uh, high precision ocean bathymetry maps? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Go on. Submarines. The Second World War was all about submarines, okay? And so in order to start to deal with the submarine problem, we needed to have a sense of where the submarines could be going. And so understanding, of course, the wide open oceans, the submarines can go anywhere, but understanding where they can go through some of these more um, uh, narrow regions uh, based on the ocean depth was something that was needed to know. So that actually is what drove um, uh, understanding the ocean floor bathymetry. And it was that ocean floor bathymetry at the end of the Second World War that kind of led into the development of plate, of plate tectonics. But the clincher, what well, actually the specific observation that led directly to the proposal of plate tectonics was um, the magnetic stripes on the ocean floor. Okay, so this is, of course, this is Iceland. This is the UK. It still is the UK. I'm very pleased to remind everybody. Do we have anybody from Scotland? Oh, no, there was nobody when we did the. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, this is the UK. And um, this is Iceland. Iceland sits right on the Mid Atlantic Ridge. So it's a big volcanic island, essentially, in the middle of the Atlantic. And then this is the Mid Atlantic Ridge coming down the Reykjanes, um, uh, Reykjanes Ridge and then continuing on through the Mid Atlantic. Okay, just to make sure you're oriented. Um, and so the magnetic stripes were first observed on this Reykjanes Ridge, this part of the Mid Atlantic Ridge just south of Iceland. Um, and so this is kind of what they look like. Um, and again, this was driven by technology developed during the Second World War, specifically the development of very high precision magnetometers. And again, surprise, surprise, the magnetometers were developed in order to detect submarines. So they essentially, ships would drag these magnetometers, and if you saw a change, in the magnetic field, you knew that a submarine had just gone by. It's just kind of, oh no, 
Okay, you knew that a submarine had, had gone by. So it's the same same submarines that drove this, uh, this this technology as well. And then after the Second World War, of course, they started to use um, the technology in, uh, in the academic domain, and people started to go and measure what the magnetic field looked like when they dragged this magnetometer um, uh, across the oceans. And lo and behold, they identified these stripes. So this, this coloring is a little confusing. You can imagine that all of the colored sections here um, have a stronger magnetization, and the non-colored regions in between, the sort of light blue stripes in between all of these stripes, are the regions that have a lower magnetization. So for some reason, there's an increase, you know, there's this sort of oscillating as you go across the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, across this, um, this shallow bathymetry here, there's an increase and then a decrease and then an increase and then a decrease in the magnetic field. And when you take a ship and you steam across here and you turn around and you come back and you come back and you sort of zigzag your way along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, lo and behold, these stripes of high uh, magnetization all line up with one another. Okay, and so these are what were identified as the magnetic stripes. And this was a really surprising result. Why would there be this variation um, in, in the magnetic field? And of course, we could spend two or three lectures talking about this. We're not. We're going to skip to the answer. What they realized was that, in fact, the Earth's magnetic field has been, um, has been switching backwards and forwards over time. So right now, the, or you can think of the Earth's magnetic field as having a bar magnet at the center of the Earth, pretty close to the rotation axis of the Earth. But what they realized was that over time, this bar magnet, it was as if this bar magnet had flipped. Okay? So North Pole pointing north, and then it's pointing south, and then it's pointing north, and then it's pointing south. And it was doing this with a periodicity of somewhere between hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years. Okay? And as this Earth's magnetic field flipped backwards and forwards, the field um, that was being uh, created um, at the mid-ocean ridge was flipping backwards and forwards. And what was actually going on was that this field was being frozen in to fresh oceanic plate um, that was forming along the Middle Atlantic. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of steps there. I said we could cover this in several lectures. Um, but, but so what we're actually seeing here is a magnetic tape recorder. Okay? And so this sort of shows the, um, uh, how this would work. So what they realized was that this shallow ridge, or the shallow ridge here, was in what was called a mid-ocean ridge. And the mid-ocean ridge is where they are forming. We are forming new oceanic plate. Okay? And so, so this is sort of the beginning. And so you create a new oceanic plate. These plates are moving apart. Uh, Eurasia and Africa are moving away from North America. And as they pull apart, magma upwells and forms new plate. And the, magnet the magnetic field of the Earth is frozen into that plate at the time that it's created. This process continues, but the Earth's magnetic field switches in the other orientation. And so a different, weaker magnetic field is frozen in for a little while, the white stripes on this cartoon. And then it flips back up, and we, we freeze in a stronger magnetic field. And this process continues, and you end up with these magnetic stripes. Okay? So they identified these magnetic stripes, and they realized that these magnetic stripes indicated that the, uh, these plate, or the mid-ocean ridge, was a, a region where we were creating new oceanic plate, and that these two oceanic plates were gradually moving away from one another. And that was what led um, to plate tectonics. And then, so that observation was in 1963. Okay, the first observation, of course, it took a few years to kind of understand this process. A few years later was when they really started to have the first global seismicity maps. And so the first really good one was published in 1968. Again, this was using the worldwide standardized seismic network that we talked about um, last, last week. Um, and so that you had global uh, coverage, and people found, lo and behold, there's this seismicity that runs all the way down the middle of the Atlantic. And then when you look at seismicity elsewhere, it's along these narrow swaths, and these narrow swaths in the oceans correspond to the mid-ocean ridges. So they started to put all of these pieces together. The idea of continental drift, of course, um, came back to the forefront. And so these are additional observations in addition to the continental drift observations, which were that the continents lined up um, and that there were these fossils. And then finally, of course, as was just pointed out a few minutes ago, once they had the ocean bathymetry, they could see that when you actually look, trace the edge of the continental um, shelf rather than the coastline, the continents actually fit together even better than when you're using the coastline. So that fit of the continents is even better than was um, originally thought by Alfred Wagner. And so we have um, plate tectonics. And so the plates are the boundaries of the plates are delimited by this shallow bathymetry in the case of the oceans and by the seismicity that we're seeing on a, on a global basis. And of course, you're all familiar with this map of what the current tectonic plates um, over the surface of the globe looks like. Um, there are basically 14 plates. There are some, you know, any good model explains 90% of the data. Actually, something that explains 90% of the data is a fabulous model, okay? So there's always, with any physical model like this, there are always little exceptions and places where it doesn't quite work. Plate tectonics explains most of the observations. We can think of most of the surface of the Earth as acting as part of, within this plate, plate tectonic uh, framework. And what that means is, is that all of the deformation is occurring at the edges of the plates. So you can think of the center of the plates, the Pacific plate, for example. You can think of the interior of the plate as being um, rigid. And all of the deformation, as these plates move with respect to one another, all of the deformation is occurring along the margins of the plates. That's what plate tectonics is. Yeah. I said a fabulous model explains 90% of the data. So the fact that there are earthquakes in places like China, okay, which is not a plate boundary, this is a region where plate tectonics, as I just described it, that all the deformation occurs at the margins of the plates, starts to break down. That's exactly right. And the places where it starts to break down are on the continents, and well, on some specific continents. And these are regions where you have diffuse. The seismicity really does indicate diffuse deformation over a wide, wide zone. And so that, that is that's a that's something that plate tectonics does not explain. Plate tectonics is just all of the deformation occurs at the edges of the plates. These are the edges of the plates, the black lines on, on this map. And so anything that's different to that is not explained by plate tectonics. And you just pointed out one of them. Good observation. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so there are 14 plates. Um, the larger plates, of course, are the North America plate, the Eurasia plate, Pacific, Antarctic plate, South America plate, African plate, and the Australian plate. Um, one of the things I love about this is um, that Tokyo, if you look here, Tokyo is actually on the North American plate, while Los Angeles is actually on the Pacific plate. So there's some unusual geometries that, uh, that you can find um, within, the, within the sort of plate tectonic framework, um, but obviously the, the plates are named primarily for the, the main mass that is on them rather than individual unusual circumstances like Los Angeles and um, Japan. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah. So plate tectonics was really proposed at the end of the 1960s. I think the 1968 paper, uh, this seismicity paper, I'm trying to remember exactly, was, was kind of, it wasn't quite proposed in this. There was a 1969 paper that really proposed it. And it was only it was sort of 1969 through 1972, 73, that it really became accepted by um, the broad community. So it was actually adopted pretty